Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sharif Abulela. I am uh, the coordinator of the Rebu Club, and I would welcome you to this edition of the ARNI Collaborative Seminar Series, this time from, uh, from Canada. Uh, for, you who, for those of you who do not know the Rebu Club, the Rebu Club group, all ARNI scientists uh, in, in Canada. And every time we're actually participating as a Rebu Club in the ARNI Collaborative Series, we're trying to, to choose for you uh, and put the highlight on uh, one aspect of the RNA biology that's taking, care, uh, taking place in, in Canada. And today it's really my pleasure, pleasure to introduce to you Eric Tecouilly, who is a professor at the IRCM uh, in Montreal. And he also uh, associated with University of Montreal and, and McGill University. Um, Eric uh, actually got his uh, PhD in, uh, finished his PhD in 2003. That's university, uh, in the University of Montreal. And then after that, he did his postdoctoral studies in the University of Toronto, where he actually started developing his passion uh, that you're gonna probably see today about our new localization. And he's taking it uh, to a different level uh, as we will see in his, in his own lab, uh, lab. He started his own lab in 2009 and uh, he actually was involved with many different collaboration, international collaboration. Many of you probably would already know of his contribution to the UNCODE project that also involved uh, different sci scientists from, uh, from the States, uh, including Chris Burge, uh, uh, Jinyao and, uh, and others, and uh, uh, Gravely also. So today he will actually be talking to us uh, about, uh, I think, he, his different uh, interest in, uh, in our new localization. Uh, we will take uh, today in, in uh, he will be talking about uh, roughly for 40, 45 minutes. And after that, we'll have time for questions. Um, the question will be taken uh, either by raising hand or by chat, uh, or uh, if there is a kind of a continuing discussion, we, I, will, uh, we, I will allow a discussion one-on-one -on -one uh, back and forth if, uh, if there is need be. When you ask a question, uh, we'll appreciate it if you open your, your camera so people can see you uh, if you like. Uh, I would like to also uh, remind you that the, the, as for the Army Collaborative Series, we will be recording the, um, the presentation and you will also have a chance to see it later on on, on YouTube. So with that, uh, thanks uh, Eric for uh, accepting the invitation and uh, I will let you uh, start. Thank you for the introduction, Sharif. Um, it's a real pleasure. Uh, I wanna thank the organizers of the uh, Arni Collaborative and Sharif for the kind invitation to come and discuss some of our work today. It's, uh, it's very nice to see some of the familiar faces and, or, or uh, names um, in the list. I'm looking forward to being able to go to international meetings once again to see uh, friends and, and colleagues. Um, so today I'll, I'll go through uh, three kind of projects we've been working on in the lab over the last um, several years. Uh, as Sharif mentioned, I'll, I'll briefly mention our, our work on uh, the systematic study of human RNA binding proteins that we conducted uh, in the context of the ENCODE consortium work. Um, just to point out uh, resources to trainees who might um, not be so familiar with it so they can uh, potentially have um, data sets and, and resources that, that use for their, their projects. Then I'll uh, discuss two, uh, two projects um, involving kind of a combination of Drosophila and, and human cell work looking at the targeting of RNAs to structures such as centrosomes and uh, cell junction uh, regions of epithelial cells and uh, kind of novel mechanistic insights or the biological implications of these processes. So as many of you know, um, as you all know, the, the uh, RNA regulation is extremely complex. If we take a, a standard um, a coding gene, uh, the, the primary transcripts will undergo um, various um, levels of regulation of, uh, you know, N modifications, splicing, RNA editing, uh, 
Uh, and there's often regulation imposed at the level of RNA export, localization, translation, and stability out in the cytoplasm. And all these events uh, tend to take place in distinct territories of the cell, whether it's uh, thinking about how the nucleus might be uh, sub-organized sub, uh, into different sub-nuclear sub structures or uh, uh, targeted regulation that might be going on for different families of transcripts out in the cytoplasm. So it's really under, to understand how uh, gene expression is controlled in subcellular space, it's important to know where uh, sets of RNAs and RNA binding proteins are found. Uh, and, and this can help us understand gene regulatory uh, processes in, in the dynamics of cell, uh, cell architecture and behavior. Um, the, the field of RNA localization has been, uh, has developed prominently since the mid eighties when the first examples of subcellularly localized transcripts were identified. Um, and and this, uh, the, the biological impacts ranges from uh, uh, important roles in um, embryo patterning uh, uh, during development. Uh, cases of this in Drosophila and Xenopus, for example, have been very well characterized. And then in differentiated cell, cell types, uh, transcripts, uh, localization and, and localized translation is really important for processes such as, such as cell migration, uh, synaptic plasticity, and asymmetric cell division. And then more recently with the whole field of, of the, the, the notion that RNAs can also be transferred outside of cells in the context of encapsulation within um, uh, extracellular uh, nanovesicles um, that are, are released by cells, it kind of brings the whole it makes us realize that localization is only, only confined to the cell of origin, but can actually be, uh, uh, have impacts across, uh, across cell borders. So our, our furry, as, as uh, Sherif mentioned, my, my interest in RNA localization came out of my work as a postdoc in Henry Krauss's lab at the University of Toronto, where we uh, conducted the first, uh, I guess, one of the first large-scale imaging-based screens of localized RNAs in uh, using the fly embryo as a model system. And here you see a mosaic of, of different uh, embryos. In, in blue, you have the RNA and, and in red, the, the nuclei of the specimen. And it, it shows the diversity of localization features that we can observe for different RNAs across developmental uh, stages. And what came out of that study was the notion that RNA localization is much more prevalent than, than initially suspected uh, since we found that about 70% of transcripts exhibited some type of asymmetric distribution in, uh, in the fly embryo uh, context. Uh, so this, um, you know, combined with uh, many uh, more recent studies uh, of people using, for example, subcellular transcriptomics, um, has really shown that, that RNA localization is a pervasive phenomenon, and it makes us realize that, you know, it's an, an important layer of regulation uh, uh, to, to consider, uh, uh, but it's a very complex process. If we also think about the, the number of RNA binding proteins encoded in our genome, and this is a, a slide from Gene Yeo's lab in, at UCSD where they tabulated about 1,072 different RBPs in this list here. And it just conveys the, the staggering complexity of uh, post-transcriptional gene regulation and how uh, we also need to uh, Put this into uh, the spatial confines of the cell. So <clears throat> the, the first story I, I would like to uh, describe is kind of a, an initial uh, effort to try to characterize the functional roles of RNA binding proteins in human uh, cells uh, that was initiated through a project, a team uh, project that was funded by the ENCODE consortium uh, fund several, uh, several years ago. Um, on which I was invited to participate with Ren Gravely and Jin Yao, our, our team leaders, and Chris Burge and Shen Gong Fu uh, uh, as well. And, and the goal here was, you know, that ENCODE for, has um, aimed to characterize the uh, principles of genome regulation, uh, either in humans or, or in, in model systems, um, often by studying processes at the level of chromatin or, or transcription events. But, uh, very few projects had actually focused on regulation acting at the post-transcriptional level. 
Yet many of the regulatory elements encoded in the genome will exert their function only once the RNAs have been transcribed. So it's, it's a really important layer to address. So the team had created kind of a sub encode project we called Encore for an encyclopedia of RNA elements, just to give it a distinct name. But, but the goal here was to try to take a segment of a, a few hundred RBPs. So there's estimated, you know, as, as you all know, maybe 1,500 to 2,000 RBPs uh, are, have been uh, uh, suggested from RNA affinity purification and mass spectrometry type approaches. And the goal was to take a segment of these and study them through systematic essays um, in two human uh, cell lines, K562 and HEPG2 cells, which were prominent cellular models used by the ENCODE consortium. And, and here, different labs would carry out different essays. So uh, Gene and Brent's lab put a lot of effort into characterizing resources, uh, um, for example, um, validated antibodies that worked well for immunoprecipitation. Uh, and and uh, to, to be able to carry out uh, essays such as enhanced cross-linking and immunoprecipitation that was conducted in Gene's lab. Uh, and then um, with the goal here to identify the transcriptomic targets of each RBP, uh, Chris's lab performed uh, an essay they called RNA binding seq, where would they, they would take purified RNA binding domains, mix it with a pool of degenerate RNA sequences, and then perform a binding essay and pull out the bound RNA. Uh, fraction. And then uh, by doing uh, deep sequencing, they could identify uh, motifs that were enriched within uh, the RNAs that were bound by a given RBP. And the goal was to have like in vitro binding data that could be combined with the in vivo uh, binding features observed by E. Uh, Brent's lab conducted systematic knockdown and uh, RNA seq, uh, knockdown of target RBPs and RNA sequencing of total cellular RNA to identify uh, changes in gene expression or, or splicing events. Uh, Fu uh, took a segment, uh, studied a segment of RBPs for their chromatin binding behavior. And to, for example, look at um, mechanisms of uh, co-transcriptional uh, recruitment of RBPs and so forth. And then our lab was tasked with taking the antibodies characterized by the group and conducting systematic imaging assays to figure out where these factors are localized in the cell. Um, this uh, kind of gives a summary. The, the paper was published last year. I'll try to just go quickly over some of the features. As I said, it's, uh, these are useful resources to point out to the community. And um, so we, we took uh, a segment of up to 356 proteins, uh, which uh, had various functionalities associated with them. If, uh, these were kind of man uh, manually curated to really take a deeper dive into the literature and what's known about those factors compared to, for example, just gene ontology terms. We also uh, here just list the localization properties, the types of RNA binding domains that were covered, and the different essays and how, how deeply uh, different essays were applied across the set of RBPs. Um, <clears throat> what came out is there were over 1,200 replicated data sets produced across the 350 RBPs. Uh, for example, the EQIP was conducted for 150 RBPs uh, in both FG2 and K562 cells, which identified close to 900,000 enriched peaks, covering about 20% of the coding transcript form. Lots of function studies identified a large number of differential gene expression and you know, hundreds of thousands of altered gene expression or, or splicing events. Um, and so there's a, uh, these are deep resources that will continue to be useful for, for a long time. And all these uh, data are available through the encodeproject.org portal. So I'd, I'd point people there if, if, uh, if they're interested. <clears throat> um, the the uh, imaging conducted in our group, we essentially organized the data within what we call the RBP image database, uh, for which you can see the, the link up here. And it's, it's a searchable tool where you can enter the cell line and, and uh, RBP name of interest. Uh, we're going to continue to populate the, the database with uh, uh, new, new data sets of screens we've conducted in, in other cellular models than the one initially uh, described or proposed in, in the ENCODE effort. Um, what we can also do is um, um, have a kind of a Google image type view of the data set and uh, what, what this nicely conveys what was done, we, for each RBP candidate, 
for which we had a validated antibody, we conducted imaging in conjunction with about a dozen subcellular markers for different organelles and subcellular structures. Um, so this goes to, for example, the, the different subcellular bodies that are known to be associated with RNA regulation, such as pea bodies, cahal bodies, or, or um, um, structures, uh, uh, organelles in the cytoplasm and so forth. And what we found is uh, uh, we, we identified groups of RBPs that localized to pretty much uh, each of these varieties of, of organelles or structures. Uh, this, um, um, so these co-labelings are just kind of uh, recap some of those examples. Um, in the lower graph here, what we find is the, um, the percent of RBPs that show a given type of localization, either in HEPG2 or in, um, I'm just going to uh, bring up the pointer. I forgot to bring up the laser, apologies. <clears throat> either in HEPG2 or in HeLa cells. And the degree of overlap between the two cell types, the, the two cell lines used. So um, we see um, um, from, in most, uh, for, for the most part, uh, there was a pretty high uh, consistency in the types of localization observed be between the different models. And some sites were very prominent uh, um, targeting sites for RBPs, such as endosomes in the cytoplasm, cells or nucleoli. Uh, some structures were a bit less represented in depending on the cell type. So for um, focal adhesion RBPs, for example, were very, uh, uh, very few were observed in HEPG2 cells um, at, versus HeLa. And this we think is just a, an indication of the, the basic cellular behavior of these cell models. HEPG2s tend to grow less, like more in a clumpy fashion and, and less uh, to adhere less well to, to the, the tissue culture dis dish. <clears throat> Um, if, if we looked at, again, the types of functionalities that these RBPs have been associated with, we found that the localization can show, can show coherent uh, associations with known functions. So nucleolus localized RBPs tend to, to bind to uh, pardon, be associated with rib ribosomal RNA processing um, uh, based on the literature um, uh, uh, function, defined functions nuclear speckles and splicing control or RNA export, um, mitochondria and mitochondrial RNA regulation. There were some opposite enrichments. So in the case of uh, nucleolus um, uh, being uh, kind of depleted in, re in regards to translational regulation and so forth. So there's a lot of potential as associations or counter associations that could be made with these types of data. And we're tr still trying to make a, a kind of a coherent uh, sense of all the potential angles that could be explored, but that's why these are community resources as well. And I think uh, other, other people are certainly uh, have, have access to the data to be able to, uh, to, to glean novel, uh, novel biological insights uh, from them. Uh, what we found is that most RAPs um, looking at just basic cyber and nuclear localization, most, most of the factors have both uh, types of localization and their and their uh, and their features. Um, uh, very few are are more restricted to cytoplasmic or nuclear compartments. Uh, and if uh, so, this in, entails probably uh, uh, potential functions in either of these compartments. Uh, and we've begun uh, comparing. So one can take these imaging data and actually uh, uh, um, develop a. Uh, use the imaging data to, to develop a nuclear cyto ratio uh, um, uh, metric for each RBP. And if one looks at the, uh, the binding behavior of the RBPs in ECLIP data, uh, specifically the binding to splice or unspliced uh, junctions of, of uh, transcripts, uh, you can see uh, like as a basic comparison that the more a factor is nuclear, over here, the more they would tend to bind to mature transcripts. Um, uh, and uh, so the spice transcripts are, are, sorry, are correlated with the cytoplasmic localization, whereas nuclear correlates with the uh, kind of the unsplice um, uh, junction read uh, association. So that, that makes uh, sense. And, and you could make these relationships with other types of RNA regulatory events within, within the data. Uh, as far as each type of localization class, if you look at ECLIP, would also be uh, tend to be associated with 
uh, particular types of uh, target uh, transcripts across um, uh, mRNA or, or non-coding transcript classes. So for example, nucleolar uh, uh, RBPs would tend to bind uh, uh, um, ribosomal RNA, mitochondrial, mit mitochondrial transcripts, and so forth. And if one looks at, for example, the RNAi data generated in Brent's lab uh, for structures such as nuclear speckles, which have been linked to, to splicing factor regulation, you can see that if factors are uh, localized to, to nuclear speckles, their knockdown tends to lead to a, a larger number of altered splicing events when you look at the RNA-seq data generated from knockdown cells compared to control non-speckle uh, RBPs, for example. So the goal of the, the project is nice to summarize, I think, by Brent's uh, a beautiful uh, uh, kind of cover page for uh, one of the Cold Spring Harbor meeting uh, uh, booklets that kind of the notion of a, trying to build a periodic table of RBPs and to take into account what their binding features are, um, what their loss of function phenotypes look like, and, and their localization, and try to, to uh, build up a coherent understanding of, of how they, they work um, in regulating uh, post-transcriptional gene, uh, gene expression. Uh, so that's all I would say about the ENCODE effort. A lot of the data has already been published. We're working on essentially a more imaging database specific manuscript at the moment, but uh, it, it still has some work uh, to, to uh, before it's finalized. But uh, I think it's, it's important to publicize this to the community. I would shift gears now to talk about some examples of RNA localization events in, um, that, that our lab has been more interested in focusing on um, for example, in our, in our previous screen in Drosophila during my postdoc and, and fly embryos, uh, a very interesting class of RNAs that came out were those transcripts localized to structures of the mitotic apparatus, whether one thinks of centrosomes or uh, the mitotic spindle, uh, astral microtubules. And a lot of these transcripts here that are uh, colored in blue um, uh, would uh, you know, encode proteins that are known to function as mitotic regulators. So it was quite intriguing. There was often this association of localization pattern to the known functionality of the, of the protein that, that they encode. One interesting transcript that came out of this uh, collection was called Centrocortin, uh, CEN, and um, it's, it encodes a coletra, the main protein that's been uh, found to be important for proper mitotic regulation in fly embryos. So work from Tim McGraw's lab in Florida had shown that you know, in SEN uh, loss of function mutants, uh, the embryos tend to display these abnormal multipolar spindles when you, when you label them with uh, markers such as cent centrosomin or uh, alpha tubulin. And what was intriguing with SEN RNA is that it showed this very beautiful dynamics uh, during at different stages of, uh, of mitosis. Uh, of the cell cycle. So in, in early syncytial stage embryos, you would get these kind of centrosomal cloud-like pattern uh, that persists throughout an anaphase. And then in interphase, uh, you see this kind of single dot of localization uh, in a region apical to um, the, the peripheral layer of, of the nuclei that are found in, in the early fly embryo. So just to position everyone, the the fly em embryo uh, develops as a syncytium initially uh, with uh, very rapid rounds of, of mitosis. Uh, and then at, at, at around uh, the 10th nuclear division, you get migration of the nuclei to the cortex of the, of the embryo and a process of cellularization that occurs where the, the membranes will uh, um, end up surrounding the nuclei in the cortex and you form this embryonic epithelium. And these, uh, these cells will have centrosomes that emanate microtubules towards uh, the central yolk region of the embryo, and which allows molecular transport in either direction. Um, and so SEN shows this localization very close to these uh, centrosomal uh, apical uh, region in, in uh, interphase embryos. So what was intriguing too about the SEN example is that um, a second transcript called IK2 showed a very similar localization pattern. And if you do a, a co-staining um, of, of both RNAs by dual 
fish, you can see a nice uh, co, uh, co localization in these prominent foci. Um, IK2 tends to form these other smaller foci as well that are not centrosome localized, which you can see as uh, only red in the, in the overlay figure. What was intriguing about these um, co localization events is that if when we dug further and look at, at both genes, they're actually uh, tend to, they are linked physically on the second chromosome uh, in the fly genome. So, uh, and they're arranged in a head to head uh, configuration with overlapping three prime UTR regions. So that was quite intriguing. It, it suggested that maybe there's a link between this uh, genomic arrangement and the downstream localization of these RNAs to the centrosomal uh, structures in, in the cytoplasm afterwards. So we did some uh, follow-up work, uh, super resolution imaging uh, conducted by Tara Patel, a student in the lab who uh, used uh, SM fish to image SEN and IK2 mRNAs and fly embryos. And she found that uh, SEN would tend to form these large contact structures uh, with which we could co-detect um, co-localizing particles of IK2 RNA. Uh, here you see some quantifications in B where uh, about 60% of SEN foci tended to have um, overlapping IK2 transcripts and about 20 uh, tended to co-localize with IK2 and, and about 20% uh, of IK2 foci tended to co-localize with SEN transcripts. And the more, uh, the bigger you had, uh, the bigger the SEN aggregates are, the more uh, IK2 RNA to, you appear to, uh, to, to recruit. And you don't see these uh, kind of co-localization features if you shuffle the images uh, as control analyses. One question we have is whether uh, these transcripts might be undergoing localized translation at these structures. And so an essay, um, Ashley Chin in the lab optimized, so she's a student whose work I'll talk about also a bit later, uh, was this uh, approach called uh, pyromycin proximity ligation essays. Um, and in this case, what we do is we, you take a cellular or embryo specimen in this case, uh, incubate it with pyromycin, which will, uh, uh, pure mycelinate nascent peptides that will become released by, by the uh, ribosome. And what you do is you take uh, antibodies against pyromycin and, and against your protein of interest, in this case, an anti sen antibody that we had at our disposal, uh, followed by secondary antibodies that are conjugated with um, circle forming oligonucleotides that allow you to do a proximity uh, ligation assay. Um, and to amplify the signal uh, to get, essentially, if, if both antibodies are in close proximity, you, you create this sandwich and you end up producing a, a uh, fluorescent signal through rolling circle amplification that is observed in our images through this green staining over here. So when Ashley performed this essay on, on fly embryos, typically you would run the pure PLA and uh, you would essentially uh, mask your primary your, your, your um, target antigen with the primary antibodies. But so she would run the pure PLA and then also add a secondary antibody that's fluorescent to try to label the, the remaining uh, epitopes and get kind of an IF, so a, a, a co IF and, and pure PLA staining at the same time. Uh, and that's what you see here. So the, the, we, she tended to observe pure PLA foci in the vicinity of where we know the centrosomes are localized like in the apical region above the nuclei, above the cortical nuclei. And these tended to also, for some of the dots, co-localize with the spot where the SEN protein was found to accumulate. So this indicated that SEN uh, undergoes localized translation in the vicinity of centrosomes. We were curious to see this, this linkage in the genome might suggest that there could be a, a functional uh, requirement for, for the, the transcripts for their uh, the localization of, of their own transcript and of the counterpart transcript. So what we did here is uh, conducted fish assays for SEN or IK2 RNA, RNA, either in wild type embryos or embryos deficient for SEN or IK2 uh, using uh, transpo transposon insertion stocks or RNAi stocks um, to, uh, as, our, as our primary material. And what we found is when you perform uh, SEN fish on SEN mutant embryos, you see a loss of signal. 
and not only of sen RNA, but also a loss of the centrosomal staining of IK2, suggesting that IK2 transcript targeting to centrosomes is dependent on the presence of sen. Uh, but the reverse um, was not true. So in IK2 RNAi embryos, you lose the IK2 signal uh, prominently, and then, um, but sen RNA is still localized to the centrosomal structure. Uh, in looking at, um, in characterizing these mutant embryos in more detail, so here is just the RT-PCR data confirming that their loss of function lead to an RNA, uh, a severe reduction in RNA levels, whether it's SEN uh, RNAi or mutant embryos or IK2 RNAi embryos here for IK2 RT-PCR or SEN RT-PCR. Uh, here we also see that the uh, these mutants display uh, embryo hatching defects, so viability issues, uh, reduction in viability. And they, if you uh, score the mitotic phenotypes, so either uh, multipolar spindles, abnormal looking uh, nuclear fallout or, or, or other abnormalities, or morphological features, we saw that uh, um, they, there was an increase in these mitotic defects or morphological defects in IK2 or SEN mutant embryos or, or loss of function embryos. Um, the next step was to see what, what are the sequence determinants of the RNA targeting of, of these transcripts to centrosomes. Uh, and so for this, we, uh, we conducted structure function assays with uh, transgenes encoding GFP fusion variants of the transcripts. So either uh, GFP fuse uh, in five prime to the coding region or three prime UTR of each. Uh, of either SEN or AK2 mRNAs, or only the coding region or three prime UTR, as you see here. So, uh, and then what we do is a, a fish against GF, the GFP portion of the RNA to see where if it uh, localized as, as endogenous. And so, basic GFP signal is more diffuse. Uh, and with SEN, um, what we observe is the coding region was the primary de determinant of localization, where you could see nice centrosomal foci in the coding region GFP fusion, but not in the three prime UTR uh, GFP fusion. By contrast, GFP IK2 uh, um, required uh, the, the uh, three prime UTR region for its targeting, but not the coding region. The coding region in itself was, was not uh, capable of mediating uh, targeting. Uh, more refined uh, structure function mapping uh, done by Julie Bergalet in the lab uh, showed uh, kind of defined a minimal region uh, required for IK2 through primary UTR uh, centrosomal targeting, which actually was the region where the two RNAs are, are uh, still overlapping. So with the anti-sense complementarity. Um, next, to, to investigate whether um, this would imply that these RNAs, uh, so we know SEN is the main driver of this co-localization and that its, its uh, coding region is involved, and you need the 3 prime UTR of IK2 for its proper localization. So what we suggest is that, uh, um, that um, um, these RNAs are, are likely becoming physically associated through a 3 prime UTR dependent uh, process. <clears throat> and what Julie did is uh, conducted uh, RNA pull-down assays uh, using fly embryo extracts, where she used bitonylated antisense RNA probes to detect, to capture either IK2, SEN, or control GFP transcript. Uh, GFP is not expressed in these, in these extracts, so it's like a background uh, control. And, and then she conducted RT-PCR uh, for either IK2, SEN, or cyclin B mRNA as, as controls. And what we found is that SEN and IK2 uh, mRNAs were both able to co-purify together in this type of pull-down essay from, from fly embryos. And EJ, uh, Injun Kuang in the lab had, had um, done in vitro pull-down essays with, um, with uh, these transcripts and uh, showed that their physical association was dependent on uh, their overlapping through prime UTR regions. So finally, I think I'll, in the sake of time, I'll just mention that we did rescue experiments um, in a, in a sun mutant background and found that the, the UTR was indeed required uh, for proper targeting of, uh, of endogenous IK2 if we rescued sun mutant embryos with 
the transgenic uh, embryos I mentioned earlier. So the mechanisms that come out is uh, that IK2 and SNMRNAs uh, um, following their synthesis pair up through, uh, through prime UTR dependent fashion uh, in order to allow co-targeting of these transcripts to centrosomes. So we don't know if uh, RNA-RNA interactions are sufficient or for additional protein partners are required for this, uh, this targeting, but it's, it's kind of an interesting example where these uh, cis natural antisense transcripts, uh, the two distinct mRNA species are able to kind of uh, be codependent and they're, they're targeting to a structure like centrosomes. I'd like to shift gears then. Uh, I'll try to go quickly over this uh, step, uh, this, uh, this final uh, kind of uh, vignette from the lab to talk about some transcripts localized to cell junction regions, which was another prominent class of RNAs that came out of the screen that I conducted as a POSAC uh, back in the day. Um, and so we identified about 0.5% of transcripts of the few thousand that were screened localized to kind of cell junction structures. And many of them actually encoded known polarity regulators. So it was always a very intriguing class of transcripts to, to, to us. And, and several nice studies uh, uh, published by colleagues in the community have, have shown also over the years that uh, certain RBPs are uh, implicated in the localization of transcripts to uh, junctional regions and that there's important implications for cell polarity control. Uh, so work, for example, from the Richter lab or uh, Dr. Kouritidis Cor Cor uh, in the Anastasiades lab uh, several years ago had also some really nice work showing the risk complex gets recruited to junctional structures and can modulate uh, RNA uh, kind of uh, uh, translation and stability features in those regions. So it was always very intriguing to us. So Ashley, a student in the lab, um, developed a project to look at um, the localization of these transcripts to cell junction structures. What are some of the determinants of their localization? Um, so. Uh, one of the first questions she asked is whether the phenotypes of your, observed in fly embryos were conserved in other tissues in Drosophila or in human uh, cellular models, for example. And so what she found is that uh, several of the transcripts, such as PYD, CANU, and Scribble, which uh, encode the, uh, their orthologs in human are Z01, Aphidin, and Scribble. They uh, localize, if you look in, for example, Drosophila ovary, Follicular, follicular epithelial cells, they also show this targeting to junctional regions. And in human MCF7 cells, Ashley also found them to be uh, somewhat junctional in their, their localization. In doing protein RNA co-labeling, uh, she also observed that the RNAs and proteins gave pretty coincident uh, signal. And in, in the MCF cell model, uh, she found that the, uh, the RNA also sometimes precedes robust expression of the protein at the sites of uh, uh, peripheral kind of uh, uh, junctional localization. So you see examples with the arrows over here. So this uh, argued there might be a localized translation of these transcripts going on. And that's, she applied the pyromycin pyro PLA assay to, to study this. And she found that several of these transcripts, Scribble, Z01, Aphidin, uh, exhibit these uh, dots of pure PLA signal that um, accumulate at sites of cell-cell contact. And in particular, she did a time course here over several days and found that early on you detect these PLA uh, in, in kind of a polarization process to detect these pure PLA foci. Uh, so it, it seems that, you know, you, you would expect maybe an RNA localization event to lead to early translational, localized translation that could then establish kind of a more robust protein pattern of a particular junctional uh, factor. She then used the antibody collection that I mentioned in the, in the opening chapter with, uh, you know, some of the uh, antibody resources developed in the ENCODE uh, consortium to um, <clears throat> screen uh, MCF7 cells, HMLE cells, and FG2 cells or um, RBPs that localize to junctional structures and, and with the goal to identify potential factors that could regulate these junctional transfers. And she found a list of about um, 25 to 30 of these RBPs, uh, some, um, some that um, uh, show kind of a 
more of a consistent localization, others with more of a striking enrichment in tricellular junction areas, for example. Um, and this is the kind of the degree of overlap between the different cellular models. So some of these candidates have been previously studied in clip type approaches. Uh, for example, the eClip data that generated by the Yo lab in, in San Diego. Uh, we consulted these data sets and found that several of the candidate RBPs for which clip data were available gave robust uh, uh, kind of enrichments for RNAs with, with uh, cell junction, uh, focal adhesion type uh, kind of go term enrichments um, compared to controls. And if you look at resources such as the clip DB uh, database, which is an online tool where they curate a lot of different types of clip data sets, we found like uh, uh, binary connections between many of her candidate RBPs and transcripts that were interested, such as Aphidin, DLG1, Scribble, and TJP factors, uh, um, or Z01 factors. Uh, here, um, to, since these data sets, uh, these clip data sets were generated in, in other cellular models, Ashley was, uh, wanted to confirm that she could see these uh, interactions, uh, the, these uh, physical linkages between candidate RBPs and these junctional transcripts also in MCF7 cells. So she conducted these RIP criteria PCR analyses. Uh, she uh, decided to design oligo pairs that would kind of tile along the different transcripts just to make sure that she got consistent signal across the RNAs. And her IPs here from Mago and PCBB3 are shown as examples. And she saw kind of enriched binding, uh, um, enriched uh, enrichments for several of the junctional transcripts in Mago or PCBB3 IPs compared to control transcripts such as RPS16 and PPI. So next you wanted to, okay, I'll, I'll try to <laughs> do this in the last uh, couple of minutes. Um, uh, conduct a loss of function assays to see if the candidate RBPs were required for the regulation of epithelial cell uh, polarization and, and proper distribution of markers along the lateral membrane of, of MCF7 cells in this case. And what she did is, uh, so did, did siRNA treatments and then measured, uh, you know, the, the width of the cells uh, along the uh, apical basal axis and the distribution of marker proteins such as TGP1 and Scribble uh, by doing IF. So you get an ex example here of a control versus Mago knockdown specimens where you see that the normal disposition of the, uh, the two markers is disrupted. And here she quantified using this heat map, uh, uh, the degree of phenotypic change between the knockdown and control specimens. So there were several interesting candidates that came out and the Mago uh, uh, factor, which is a component, a core component of the exon junction complex came out as a, as a very interesting candidate that had robust a phenotype, phenotypic effects with regards to uh, the epithelial uh, uh, polarization defects. And <clears throat> she, she went on to perform pure PLA on, on RBP depleted cells, uh, either PCBP3 or Mago uh, B in this case, and found, uh, for example, that the uh, pure PLA foci uh, were, became sparse in, in those knockdown specimens. Here on is just used as a control that should uh, display very few dots. And, and so you see her, what she then did is imaged and quantified using a microscopy mask approach, the number of pure PLA foci that were in proximity to cell junction structures. And she found that uh, depletion of several of the RBPs led to a, a significant decline in the number of, uh, of junctional uh, scribble PLA foci. Uh, yeah. But this was also true for Z01, for example, uh, pure PLA signal. And then the final result is uh, actually decided to come back in the fly and see if depletion of the fly orthologs of some of these RBPs would lead to a perturbation of the localization of uh, these junctional transcripts or of their encoded proteins, and if it would lead to any kind of uh, 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 apparent epithelial polarity or, or structural defects. So what she found here is that Mago RNAi induced by using the GAL4 UAS system and a traffic jam GAL4 driver, which will drive hairpin RNA uh, for Mago in the 
follicular epithelium of the uh, of the uh, egg chamber of the fly uh, leads to uh, here a, a defect in the targeting of PYD RNA, um, as you can see by RNA fish here comparing control to to Mago uh, depleted. And also the PYD protein, uh, which we uh, were stained using a, a homemade antibody that we, we've uh, produced, uh, also gave a kind of a loss of signal at the, at the junctional region. So uh, this suggests, you know, the exon junction complex has been linked to uh, RNA localization in several previous studies, work from the more Lahir and uh, Efrusi labs, for example, had shown uh, an important role for, for EJC components in, in proper RNA localization. So what we think is uh, happening here is these junctional transcripts uh, require the EJC components. Um, Ashley, we, I showed you Magoo, but Ashley has evidence for several of the other core components of the complex uh, being involved in proper uh, targeting. Uh, apologies for the resolution on, on this last figure. Um, and so we think that this uh, identifies candidate RBPs that are required for the targeting and localized translation of these uh, uh, proteins that are uh, key components of these uh, cell junction structures. And you could think of interesting clinical implications there since disruption of epithelial polarity is really a hallmark of, of uh, carcinoma. And so um, it'll be interesting to figure out if there's a, an angle of RNA mislocalization in these types. So I'd like to thank you for your attention today uh, and apologies for going over time a bit. I'd like to um, acknowledge people in the lab uh, who contributed to these different stories, past members, so Louis, Philippe, uh, Benoit Bouvret, Julie Bergalet, uh, Charles Wine for um, uh, several of the stories I told, Dara Patel and Ashley Chin in particular for uh, the stories on SEN and, and uh, cell junction transcripts. Um, so thank you for, and, and also obviously collaborators and, and funding agencies who supported the work. So uh, thanks again, Shea, for the invitation. Happy to take any questions you may have. Great, thanks a lot, Rick. Uh, very interesting presentation indeed with lots of data. I think it will take people some time to digest. So now we are open for questions. Uh, raise your hand, chat. Um, and I think while people start thinking, I'm not seeing any raised hand yet. So while we're we're thinking about that, maybe I'll I will start by a couple of questions. Eric, one is, um, did you actually notice any uh, pronounced RNA localization differences between cell line? Like at least when you compared uh, your work between the HeLa and HepG, is there some kind of um, uh, kind of uh, RNA or RNA binding protein that show localization differences? Uh, the three different between different cell line, human cell lines, I, I'm, I'm talking. There, there are uh, kind of classes I, I pointed out, for example, the focal adhesion uh, subset, which are less less ob observed in hep G2s. So I think it, it's tailored to the, the behavior of the cells. Um, but it's something we, we would need, need to dig further. Uh, we, for example, have done screens in more normal cells, like HMLEs are more uh, or non-transform, so it would be, uh, we're hoping to, to be able to analyze that data in more detail and see if we could find some uh, distinguishing features between cancer versus non-cancer. Yeah, cancer. it was actually, yeah, this was actually my second question to say whether or not you would use a, a mortalized cell line rather than cancer cell line to see how it, how it goes. So I think it's something that you maybe want to try. Okay, so we start getting some hands. So I will, uh, I think the next question from uh, Antonis. Please. Hello. If I, if I pronounce it correctly. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, it's, it's, I know it's too good for you. Uh, <laughs> so, Eric, thank you for so much. That was a fantastic presentation, data. Really, really beautiful work. Uh, so, uh, my question would have been would be uh, whether the targeting, uh, whether the local, localized translation of zone one of scribble, etc., affects also the targeting of the just the targeting of the protein, or also their overall levels, the efficiency of translation, how much protein is, is in the cell. Yeah, that's a good that's a good uh, point. For now, we don't we don't really know, but it would be interesting to see, um, yeah, how how it influences the the types of protein modules that are formed. If if they uh, if you get defects in the the formation of those structures, um, and really tie it in with a more precise measurement of of those kinds of effects. 
I'm not sure if I'm answering the question properly, but uh, yes, I, I mean wondering. more or less. Yes. So, you know, is it, for example, is it critical to form a junctional complex, uh, or else it, does it also affect the, the efficiency of translation? And you know, the zone one levels of our own this are lower, oh, and that yeah. affects the polarity, for example. I mean, more or less, you, you touch to that, but yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. So I think um, Ashley might have done westerns on some of her depleted cells, and so that would be. Uh, good to distinguish whether it, the overall pool of protein is the same or if it's uh, if it's uh, reduced um, if you don't have the local translation going on properly. It, it's not obvious that we're seeing a lot of pure PLA dots elsewhere than at the junction, so I would tend to favor more of a, a general shutdown, but it's, it's something we would need to look at more closely. Thank you. Thanks for your question. We had a question by, from Ashwin. You still interested in asking questions? I think Elisa had one. I don't know. Hi, uh, can, can you hear me? I was, I was trying to write that. Um, well, thanks for an amazing seminar. I have three questions here. Um, so have you looked at the, the thermodynamic stability of 10 IK2 uh, RNA on the interaction, or do you have an estimate of it and what its, it's bi biological consequence would be? I had trouble hearing the, the first part. Like, would it be possible to repeat the question? Oh, yeah, the, the thermodynamic stability of the thin MIK2 RNA RNA interaction. Do you have, have you, uh, uh, do you have an estimate of that? If we have an idea of the stability of the interaction. Yeah, yeah and what it's con bi biological consequences are. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, what we've, when we've imaged, for example, both of these transcripts are maternally deposited. In the in the egg, there, we don't have evidence of zygotic production. So, and we've done staining on ovaries, for example, and shown that the uh, the RNA is also co-localized to a certain extent in, in early ovaries. So, it would suggest that those maternal transcripts are able to stay associated through um, um, through transitioning uh, into early embryogenesis. Uh, but it's only a certain proportion of um, of the RNAs, so I think you get kind of a Velcro mechanism that will keep them associated, but only on a, on a small percentage. I don't know how that translates in terms of binding affinity or stuff like that, but uh, it would be- my, yeah. yeah, sounds great. And my second question is um, the localized translation, is it associated with a, a subset of ribosomes? So we have heterogeneity in ribosomes, right? So have you uh, looked into it? We haven't, but it's a really good question for sure. Like if, um, uh, you could imagine you could have uh, this is very pure speculation, but it, it, you know the possibility of having ribosomes that would be tailored to different sites in the cell based on their post-translational modifications or components, and and uh, uh, translating RNAs with different efficiencies is very very intriguing to a lot of people, I guess. <laughs> um, thanks. I, I see uh, Elisa had a question. What proteins do you think may be binding to the SEN RNAs? Uh, we've done some RNA pull down and mass spectrometry approaches. We saw several um, several RBP candidates that we re really haven't followed up so much on yet. You might suspect like there could be a role for double stranded RNA binding proteins, maybe acting as uh, clamps to keep those two RNAs together. Um, uh, we 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 don't know if. Um, if it's purely an RNA-RNA interaction interface, or if, if proteins are there to stabilize the uh, the, the association. Yeah. So, and also following on your comment about um, these are maternally deposited, how long do they persist there at the centrosomes? Yeah, we'll see them all the way uh, into um, uh, the you know early cellularization. So it, it's kind of intriguing that. They're remaining associated with pretty much all the, the nuclei um, or the, the centrosome uh, uh, kind of um, foci that we can see. Um, there, there was also um, cases where we saw asymmetry, but I still haven't fully grasped like how uh, it's likely some mother mother centrosome association or something, but I um, it's something we would have to dig uh, in, in more detail uh, in the future. We, we just didn't have really good markers for to distinguish mother-daughter uh, centrosomes. And, uh, but, but there's interesting asymmetry also that may be happening 
if you think of uh, um, how how certain cells within your syncytium might inherit different or uh, cellularization, a cellularizing embryo might inherit different amounts of those RNAs is, is kind of intriguing, but but I'm not sure if it um, if this would imply any type of uh, cell fate uh, differences between the cells that would uh, be derived from uh, have the mother uh, or daughter centrosome later on or something. I'm and, not sure if I'm being very clear, but in this. <laughs> <laughs> well, and also I was wondering about like just over the stages of the cell cycle, do yep. you see any differences in the RNA localization at the centrosome, like position of it or uh, intensity or something? Uh, I think it's something we need to address in more detail. So for sure in interphase, you get more of that centrosome proximal dot, and then it becomes more of a astral microtubule like appearance during the mitosis. So whether that involves um, release of these RNAs along the astral microtubules and they get kind of re, um, relocalized to more compact foci later on in an interface, it's, it's kind of, uh, it would be really interesting to have live, uh, live imaging capabilities for these transcripts and see how they behave. Okay. Uh, any other question? I don't see any raised hand. Here is your chance. Okay, if there is no more questions. Oh. Um, thanks a lot, Eric, for uh, the very interesting talk. And uh, thanks everyone for participating and uh, looking forward to see you in the next installment of the RNA Collaborative Seminar Series. Indeed, thank you so much, uh, Sheikh, and uh, to the rest of the, the attendees. It's uh, been a pleasure to participate. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone.